Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, also known by many of you as Mr. Valuation. You know, there are times when certain sectors get hot and they, you know, they run and they run for reason sometimes. Sometimes they run without reason. That's really part of the dilemma here. But when you get something that's real trendy, you know, the average lay investor tends to get caught up in the hype and the hysteria. But the problem is they're usually late to the party. And that's one of the real, I think, dangerous aspects about trying to invest in trends. One of those trends right now is infrastructure. You know, under the current administration, there's a lot of talk about massive multi-trillion dollar infrastructure spending. And as a result, a couple of things have happened. Infrastructure stocks have, first of all, gotten hot. But the problem is, you know, as an investor, the oldest adage in investing is buy low and sell high. And the problem is because these things all of a sudden, you know, the world has decided that infrastructure is a good place to invest. The demand for infrastructure stocks has risen dramatically and the market has driven up their prices. And the problem is we're usually late to the party. That's one of the biggest I think plights of the average everyday investor is the secret of a trend is to get ahead of the trend. Now, that's easier said than done. But the reality of it is, for example, until this last election, which obviously wasn't that long ago, we really didn't know what was going to happen. But having said that, infrastructure has been a political bipartisan issue for quite a long time. I, you know, we all know that, you know, bridges and a lot of our infrastructures need to be rebuilt. So infrastructure stocks have actually been of interest but more recently, because of this massive spending program that's been, you know, bandied about now, the infrastructure stocks have really got strong. So I'm going to take a look today at some of the major infrastructure stocks that we're all familiar with. These are the, the obvious ones, if you will. Okay, I'm going to be looking at things like Ellison Transmission, Cummins, the diesel manufacturer, Oshkosh, which makes lifts and things, Federal Signal, Elamo Group, Aztec, and then, of course, Deer, Caterpillar, and Terex. Now, these are all very popular and have been popular, and for good reason, infrastructure stocks for a long time. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this list here, and I'm going to show you some very interesting aspects. You know, each of these stocks are unique. I always say it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. But virtually every one of these stocks is cyclical or at least quasi-cyclical to an extent. And that's something that's very, very important to understand as an investor when you're looking at investing in these things. So let's start out with my first example. I'm going to look at Federal Signal. And, you know, what I want you to see here is the stock, you know, the real advantage of fast graphs, you can look back at a company, you can look at a company from a historical perspective and immediately know what kind of business it's been. So let's just look at what's happened. The earnings growth rate going back 20 years has only been 1.49%. Now, if I shorten this time frame where I'm, you know, coming just, you know, before the recession and coming in, it ratchets up to 6.3%, but this still includes three or four, you know, pretty bad years. So if I shorten this even more to where I get, you know, coming out of the recession, now my growth rate has jumped up to 11.64%. And I'm going to go ahead and take one or two more years off of this. Now we're up here to a 33% growth rate. So I want you to notice that, you know, the prospects of these cyclical businesses can change dramatically from one period to the next. Now, looking at this graph from this perspective, going back only to 2012, the market has been valuing this at approximately a 19 P.E. That's a high P.E. If I look at the company again from the long term perspective, it's valued it at a 23 P.E. Historically, there have been times. But I want you to notice when valuation is high like this, like it was back in 02, and then, you know, operating results perform poorly. This stock performed very, very badly for many, many years here. You know, it actually would have cost you over 80% of your money had you bought it in 02 and held it to 2011. Now, once the stock got inexpensive relative to its previous value, its stock price, but it was still heavily overvalued here. The PE I'm pointing to right here is 49. But what happened was there was 10 cents worth of earnings that more than tripled, almost quadrupled. To, you know, So we had a 270% earnings growth rate, followed by a 159% growth rate. And so what really started to happen here is we started to get really strong earnings growth. And then the stock has performed over this period of time at a double digit 25% annualized rate of return, you know, giving you eight times your original investment over this time frame, including dividends, which by the way, they cut the dividend 
during 2011 and 12. They've been steadily paying a dividend over the last several years here. And let's take a look at that, you know, just to give you some perspective. The performance over this time frame, which is different, has been 27% a year. The dividend growth has been 23% a year. Okay, but it's a relatively short time span. That's really what I want to get across here. So, you know, when you're dealing with cyclical stocks, you're dealing with stocks that have a lot of unpredictability beat in. So to kind of evaluate that further, let's go ahead and look at the analyst scorecard. In this case, I want you to notice there were in 09, 10, and 11, the analysts missed earnings estimates dramatically. And this is when they were making the estimate one year prior to the actual being reported. Okay, so this wasn't updating the estimates as you went along. This was a full prior advance, and this gives them a 10% margin of error. The two-year consensus estimate this time was also pretty bad. And here we're actually giving them a 20% margin of error. So the point is, analysts were wrong on a one-year forecast 42% of the time, and they were wrong 50% of the time on a two-year, even with a 20% margin of error. I think that's really important to understand that, because when you're looking at some of these misses here that, uh, that these cyclical stocks you know, produce, I mean, they missed it by large margins, 75, 80% margins. The analysts were saying, you know, $1.22 for 2016, for example, and earnings only came in at 69 cents. So you're dealing with very, very cyclical, unpredictable business here. Now, when I go into forecasting then, first of all, I've only got a forecast for this year, and there are seven analysts participating in it. But I also want you to notice that the estimates Six months ago, we're $1.82. They've dropped to $1.80, and they've kind of stuck there. So that's what analysts are looking for, you know, currently. This would indicate that the stock is significantly overvalued, you know, with a P.E. of 22.7, with an estimated growth rate of, of about 7 and three quarter percent or so. The trend line growth rate, how is a little better. It's forecast to be 12%. Now, what I like to do is go to the custom calculator here and combine the two to give me a broader perspective. The reality of it is I don't see much rate of return on this stock over the next two or three years because, and here's the key point, I'm going to be harping on this. You know, the stock has already had a run-up. The infrastructure play is already priced in in this stock, if you will. But it's one of the least you know, priced in. Let's move on. Let's look at Oshkosh. Oshkosh is a very interesting company as well. They make specialty vehicles. Uh, they have a defense segment. They have, you know, rough terrain response. But from a standpoint of the infrastructure, they also have building supplies, you know, Oshkosh trucks and so on. So it's a play in the actual sub-industry is construction machinery and heavy trucks. Now, again, we see this enormous cyclicality. This is the nature of the beast. This is the type of company you're dealing with. You get these periods where earnings growth, you know, looks really, really good for several years. Then it collapsed. This was the Great Recession. Then it follows up with this huge surge. I'm not sure why that happened. Then again, we had this, you know, collapse of earnings for a couple of years. And then we've had cyclical growth. And now all of a sudden the infrastructure is getting hot. Now, growth for the next couple of years looks very, very attractive, double digit. And the stock has reacted. You know, it was reasonably valued based on a normal P.E. of around 15, let's say, uh, or even a 14 P.E. And, you know, back in October of 2020, you know, four or five months ago, and then now the stock has really rallied. You can see how it's got a higher valuation than it's ever traded at. And every time it's had a high valuation like this, it's, you know, reverted to the mean eventually. So when I look at forecasting here, I am looking at an expectation of pretty good results. So if these analysts are right and we get this growth rate, this stock is on the high end of fair value. It's not overvalued just because it's above the orange line because it's still within these four orange lines here, but it's fully valued. In other words, it's not a bargain here. But if I go out here, you know, this stock could be double digit returns if it traded at a 19 PE ratio, which is what the forecast growth rate here is. So I want you to note this orange line is a PE of 19. 0.85. So we are pricing in a higher than normal 15 at the 15 ish PE ratio. And here I've got 15.88. Your rate of return would be just about a break even stock. So, you know, for this to make you any money, it's got to hit these forecasts. 
but you also got to get the opportunity to get a high multiple on your stock. Now, currently, it's trading at a 22 multiple. So if it traded at that, you know, 22-ish multiple, which would be this orange line right here, your rate of return over the next 18 months could be annualizing at about 23%. So this looks like it might not be too late. The long-term growth on this stock is expected to be 17%. But I want to remind you of something. Cyclical stocks are hard to forecast. So let's look at the analyst scorecard of how accurate analysts were making a one-year and a two-year forward forecast. And again, you can see that there are times when the analysts miss the forecast by a huge margin. So, you know, the, the two-year even has a 20% margin in error. So when I summarize this, for the one-year estimate, analysts have missed it about a third of the time. For the two-year forward, they've missed it about 40% of the time, okay? And that's even with these margins of error, you know, built into the calculation here. So the real question is, you know, when you're looking at these forecasts and you're looking out even out two years, how much credibility do you want to give them? Now, you get some guidance here with the forecasting calculators. Also remember, these are calculators. They're simply saying, this is what the analysts are saying. This is what the numbers would look like. And then they give you the ability to just point to these dots out here and just run these calculations. I call them what-if scenarios. You know, they're, they're very easy to do. And you can calculate, what if it traded at this PE? What if it traded at that PE? So that's a, a good advantage of the tool. But the real question is, how accurate are these estimates? Now, this is something very, very interesting I want you to take a look at. Notice how the estimate has panned out over the last six months or so on this stock. All right, so for 2021, six months ago, analysts were forecasting 564. Then just three months ago, it went down to 506. Now it's back up to 560, the most recent previous estimate, and now that has since been raised to 563. All right, so, you know, the estimates change. Here we saw estimates for 2022 at 650. Now they're forecasting 742. And you can see that there's been a steady progressive increase in the estimate going out to 2022, just as we've seen for 2023. Now, the further out you go, I think you also have to be practical and recognize that the less likely these estimates are to be perfectly correct. And also notice that the number of estimates analysts drop off from 16 for these next two years, and it gets cut in half to only eight going more forward. So you want to be careful recognizing the fact that this is a very cyclical company. Now, it has been a growth you know, business. The, the earnings over the long term have grown, but it's dealing with these in-between cycles that become the real challenge with this kind of company. Now I want to go into the more commonly or more better known you know, companies, A-plus rated Cummins, the diesel manufacturer. I call this stock quasi-cyclical. I want you to see here that you've got a very high correlation between earnings and price. Now remember, Remember, these cyclicals, you know, it's hard to predict what these cycles are going to look like in advance. But now all of a sudden we've had this, you know, one of the biggest deviations that you've seen in this 20 year history of the price. Now, there's some justification for that. Earnings estimates are going from a negative 19 percent for fiscal 2020, you know, which obviously ended in December followed by double-digit estimates for the next two or three years. So when you look at Cummins going forward, you know, the estimates are high. Now, the stock is outside of the valuation corridor, if you will. So it's, you know, moderately overvalued, but it would generate, you know, potential decent rates of return. If you look at the normal multiple in this stock, it's only been about 14 times earnings. So you would be looking at losses. In other words, the horse has already left the barn here. The price has already risen in anticipation of this infrastructure spending. And you can see the time to have bought a stock like Cummins would have been back here when you could have bought it when you were getting good earnings growth. And yet the valuation was down in the, you know, PEs of 12 and, and so on. Now we've got a PE of 20, which is actually one of the highest price earnings ratios this stock has ever traded at. I, I do want to make that point. So this is obviously an aberrant valuation. Now the company has an excellent dividend record. If you look at the long-term dividend record of Cummins, they've grown their dividend by over you know, 16% a year. So it's an interesting income play, and it still does give you a 2% yield, but you're not buying it as a bargain. The time to have bought Cummins would have been back when its price was inexpensive. Now, when you look at the scorecard, 
Once again, you know, I'm going to go ahead and just give you the summary. Analysts have missed the one-year forecast about a third of the time and the two-year forecast about 40% of the time. But the companies also beat estimates 33% of the time on the one-year and 33% of the time on the two-year. So, you know, recognize that you're dealing with cyclical stocks here when you're dealing with infrastructure stocks. Next would be, you know, John Deere, or now known as Deere and Company. Very similar picture to what we saw, you know, with Cummins a minute ago. We see this very nice correlation between price and earnings where, you know, there is a relationship between fundamentals and the true worth value of a stock. Now, we are expecting massive increases of earnings here. Analysts, if I look at what the analysts are forecasting, they're expecting an 83% increase. This partially justifies this massive increase in price. When you look at it from the historical graph, it's much more dramatic here. You know, the stock from when it was trading at about a 14 and a half PE back in March of 2020 is now trading, you know, at a um, PE of 32. So we've had more than a doubling of the PE and we've had 170 percent plus rate of return on this stock in one year's time. All right. And, and that's, you know, buying it at fair value made sense, but that's because these earnings estimates have ratcheted up. Let's look at the forecasting calculator here. And, and I really want you to see what's been going on with Deer and Company. Six months ago, the analysts were expecting $10.32. Then three months ago, it was $12.82 for this year. Now it's $15.95. So we've seen a progressive increase or, you know, increased optimism on the 19 analysts that are following. But this is a very, the reason you've got the little red, you know, warning sign here, this is an 83% surge in earnings expected by these analysts, followed by 16% for the same group of analysts. And again, you see the earnings estimates went from six months ago, $12 a share up to $18 a share. So the analysts are definitely getting more positive and more sanguine about Deer and Company. We lose some of the analysts out here in the third year. The further out you go in the estimate chain, the more difficult it is. And there's only 12 analysts making an estimate, but they are expecting 14%. The long-term growth rate expectations for this stock, now there are only three analysts in this universe, are for 33%. So Deer could still be an excellent long-term investment if you're willing to, you know, take the risk of what might happen over the short run. If this gets back to a normal valuation, you know, over the short run, just using the calculator function here over the next two years, you could see a negative rate of return for the next couple of years before you were able to participate in this massive growth that they're expecting. But again, I want to remind you when you look at the historical you know, nature of this company, you do get periods where the earnings growth tends to be very strong for extended periods of time, then falls, and then it's strong again. And then, of course, COVID kind of interrupted earnings here. So let's, you know, let's, and by the way, this company has an October fiscal year. So put that into your thought process also. So this might be just a continuation of a long-term trend, which is turbocharged a little bit by the infrastructure spending that, you know, that, that we're currently seeing and currently looking at. Let's move on and look at Caterpillar. Now here, it's very similar to what we saw with Deer, but actually it's even more cyclical. I want you to notice that the earnings drops tend to be much larger, you know, 61% during the recession, 32% in 2013. You do get extended periods of time where you get strong earnings growth, then we get a, a cycle interruption, then you get some strong earnings growth, another cycle interruption, some strong earnings growth, and then of course COVID kind of messed up the party. But look how this stock has really rallied. The point is, you know, right now, I believe we're all becoming late to the party if we invest these. Now, I own Caterpillar, but I bought it when it was trading at a much better valuation. Actually, I've owned it for several years. Once again, when I look at the forecasting, analysts are expecting pretty strong growth. It's still, you're paying a dear price, no, no pun intended on the John Deere you know, example I just used, but you're paying a high price here to buy this growth. That's the point that I want to get across. You can really see it clearly in these historical graphs where this is the highest deviation from the fair valuation intrinsic value line here that we've ever seen on the stock. And then if I look at the analyst scorecard, once again, 
I have, uh, you know, cyclicals are hard to, to forecast. It's really that simple. You know, the analysts have missed the two-year forward forecast half of the time. They've beat it 25% of the time and hit it 25% of the time. And even on the one-year forecast, they've missed it 42% of the time. So, you know, even though the analysts are getting, you know, much more sanguine about, you know, what the company's prospects are, estimates went from $7 up to the $8 range, and then they went from 887 for 2022, now to 1057. So obviously, you know, confidence is building for these kind of stocks, and that's something to be, you know, cognizant of when you're looking at them. The Elmo Group is another one that's very interesting. It's probably got one of the better, more consistent growth records of any of them. But with, for that reason, I think this is a very interesting research candidate to look at because you can see that, you know, the only times it really got way overvalued, it always reverted to the mean. And, you know, that was even more recently in 2017. And now all of a sudden we've got this, you know, huge separation from, you know, from fair value. When I look at it from the forecasting perspective, you can really see it clearly. Here's the long-term forecast of 10%, you know, estimated growth. The nearer-term estimates are for 33% growth. This just means there's no analyst giving a dividend estimate. But notice the analysts went from nine analysts for this year down to three. So, you know, this isn't as widely followed as some of the others I've shown you here. And so I'd want you to be careful. Once again, when I look at their analyst scorecard, you know, they had a pretty good record for a while, but more recently, you know, the analysts have been missing it, but it has one of the better scorecards of any that we've looked at. Analysts have only been wrong about a quarter of the time on average for the one and the two year consensus estimates on Alamo. Nevertheless, you know, this stock, I believe, does have some opportunity. If these analysts are correct, this would be one that could make you some decent money. It might not actually be too late to get into, but again, if the analysts are correct, and as you can see, that's a relatively big if. Aztec Industries is another one. Very, very cyclical company. You know, when you're looking, how do you predict a stock like this? And so when I go into the analyst scorecard, you know, you can look at it. It has really a, an abysmal analyst scorecard. You know, 58% of the time they're wrong on the one year, 75% of the time on the two year. So now I've got these very strong forecasts you know, going for the long-term trend line growth of 20%, near-term growth of 20%, 20.43 to be precise. You know, I don't know that I believe these numbers. Now, the numbers have, you know, held pretty steady on this stock relative to some of the others we've talked about. But once again, when you look at the historical operating history of this company. And look at the volatility here. Look how unpredictable. This would be obviously a very, very hard stock to, you know, buy and hold. And I don't think buying it at a peak valuation like this, one of the highest valuations that it's ever traded at, makes any sense if you're being practical and realistic in your assessments here. The next one I'm going to go is Terex. This is another extremely cyclical stock. I mean, this company goes from you know, just having massive earnings growth achievements to, you know, losing money. They started a dividend. They cut the dividend during COVID. You know, the earnings grew and the price reacted. Then COVID came and it hit. Now it's rising again. Forecasts on this stock are for unbelievable numbers. They're talking 190% forecast earnings growth rate for the next three to five years. If I use the custom calculator here and add the near-term estimate data, this stock looks like an absolute gold mine you know, going forward. The estimates, the near-term estimates look good. It would actually give you the opportunity to make very, very high rates of return. But once again, I got to look to the analyst scorecard. How good are these estimates that I'm looking at? And when I look at its scorecard, it's horrible. 67% of the time, even with a 10% margin of error, the analysts have been wrong on this stock. So even though you're seeing, you know, some interesting numbers and, and notice that the analysts in 2020, they went from losing money OK, they thought it was going to lose money to make to, you know, losing a dollar to losing seven cents. And the company actually made a little money on this case. And then in 2021, they went from a dollar. Now they're estimating two dollars, went from a dollar 90 for 2022 and et cetera. And we still have a pretty good consensus of analysts following this. But again, you know, when you look at the history of this stock and look at just the unbelievable unpredictability of it, how can you put any 
real credence in those numbers. Now, last but not least, I want to take a look at Ellison Transmission. This stock has been you know, public in this form only since 2011. It's got a cyclical record like all the others, but it's also got a nice growth record. It hasn't really ever lost money. The dividend record is good. They did freeze the dividend, I want you to notice, for several years, but they did maintain and pay the dividend every year. When I look at the analyst scorecard here, though, once again, even though I've got a short time frame here, the analysts have missed it 50% of the time on the one year forward, 57% of the time on the two year forward. And when I look at forecasts, the forecasts have been pretty, pretty similar. They went from 355 six months ago to 379 currently. And that's, that's showing a little positive increase, but not much. And the analysts have, you know, stayed in the ranges on this stock. Now, this could be a tremendous investment from a standpoint of it's, this would be one of the infrastructure stocks that is actually fairly valued today that you could still play. And, you know, if I can go in my corporate links here and go into the, to the website of this company, you can see they're involved in things like, you know, construction, you know, tractor trailer trucks, but they also have fire and emergency, garbage, buses, etc. So it's kind of a, you know, it's the Ellison transmissions. Everybody knows Ellison for their transmission, probably the most famous transmission company out there. It's got a good opportunity here. It might be the only one that I would actually recommend that you might want to take a real closer look at here. The others are riskier. You might want to speculate in them. You know, that's it's your choice. What I'm doing here is just trying to show you the nature of the beast here. Infrastructure might be an exciting market going forward. I do believe the horse has already left the barn for most of them. So I would, you know, caveat emptor, as I like to say, buyer beware, invest with caution. It's been Chuck Harnwell saying uh, thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, did give me a like, a thumbs up, ring the bell. You know, give me a, a subscription if you're not already a subscriber. I've got some more interesting videos coming up even this week. Thanks for watching. Talk to you again real soon.